I think one of the things that's almost certain when you ask to present is that you'll prepare uh, probably double the number of slides that you have time for. And then if you interact that with a draconian chair who sends you an email the night before telling you he's going to manage your time, you know that you're never going to finish your presentation. But I'll, I'll give it a go. So this is a, a paper that tries to do three basic things. One is to describe trends and um, even in a comparative static way, uh, try and understand inequality in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Secondly, to give you a little bit of a story about structural change, uh, if one thinks of this morning's presentation from Justin Lin, uh, in the context of sub-Saharan Africa. And then finally, a, a sort of a whistle-stop tour of possibly some of the drivers um, that may be influencing and shaping inequality. I should say at the outset that in, in almost every single case, we are not working with micro-level data. Um, if you're within uh, the World Bank or, um, or, or the UNDP, as the case may be, country-level agreements will give you access to the micro-data. And as uh, wonderful and as nice as Kathleen and Chico and the World Bank staff are, they're legally bound by those agreements and cannot give you access to the micro-data. So for, for individual researchers, uh, working with such data, it actually becomes uh, quite difficult. So most of our estimates are based on the PovCalNet um, data. So we all know the background, or at least uh, if you work in Africa, the background uh, to this sort of, is this the final frontier as a continent where six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world have been from sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, and that's really been the story if one thinks of the public debate and the discussion around Africa. But of course, lurking beneath that, uh, lies the slightly bigger concern around um, whether such growth rates or whether this growth spurt has generated um, uh, distributional outcomes. The literature, as you know, is wide and deep. Uh, I, I've summarized it in the paper, which you can have access to, as sort of, sort of three big storylines. The first is essentially that you will get uh, that growth accompanied by, if I can find my... So growth accompanied by a rise in, in, in income inequality will reduce the growth poverty elasticity. And that's just a simple way of saying that inequality is often the thief of the growth poverty relationship, uh, that if you have large increases in income inequality, it will reduce the elasticity. Uh, there is the path dependency issue, which I'll come back to later, that a high initial level of income inequality will make it much, much harder for, uh, for poverty to fall in the face of high growth rates. Uh, and Related to that is the, is the notion that you may you often find fairly uh, a fairly wide range of growth poverty elasticities, but not so much with inequality and growth. But that's a literature that's well known to this audience. So what is our our headline result? Well, we took the uh, PovCalNet data and looked at the average Gini coefficient for Africa, and all the detailed data issues are here and, and in the paper. And we came up with an average Gini of about 0.43. When we looked at other developing countries, the average Gini was 0.39. Statistically significant, right, <laughs> the difference. We took different measures. We took the ratio of the top 20% to the bottom 20%, uh, and that ratio was 10 to 1, right, in the case of sub-Saharan Africa, and it was just under 9 for the rest of the developing world. If you split the sample uh, from sub-Saharan Africa into income groups, low income, lower middle income, and upper middle income countries, you get a similar result. What you tend to find is even by income group categories, um, income inequality levels in sub-Saharan Africa are higher uh, relative to a sample of developing countries. And that was, uh, I think, a fairly new result, as simple as it is, uh, that we didn't have a sense of what uh, African inequality looked like. So we scratched a little bit more. And um, the... Kamalgarov Smirnov test for the significant difference shows that these uh, these guys can be rejected. So these guys are actually different, from, significantly different from each other. And so even in a distributional sense, you've got uh, higher levels of income inequality in sub-Saharan Africa, the blue line relative to the rest of the developing world. It turns out, though, and if I had to pick a sort of one one result that surprised us, is the second bullet here that the data shows that there are these seven outlier African countries, and we list them there, the sort of uh, Angola, um, Car, Central African Republic, and then a whole host of, interestingly, Southern and Eastern African economies, which drive this result. 
When you remove those seven outlier African economies, there's no significant difference in that previous table between the mean African genie and other developing countries. Here's a huge economic history project. Uh, and if Finn was here, I'd say a big wider project. Is there something going on? Uh, some would argue that there's the economic history of colonialism and conquest in Southern Africa that's very different to, to West Africa. Andrea mentions that in his paper as well, that may explain this difference. But certainly, uh, without these seven outlier African economies, inequality levels between the developing country regions and Southern Africa disappears. The movements in the Gini over time as Kathleen has sort of uh, referred to as well, but for us it, it tends to get messy because now we're working with absolute estimates, we're trying to average across surveys and we, we, we're not sure about the quality of the surveys, we uh, take them all from PovCalNet and so on, but essentially you get a result, and I will be skipping a lot of slides as a forewarning, that looks like so, if you look at the three right bars, right, that essentially over the period 94 to 2013, you've seen an overall decline, that's the red bar, in inequality in sub-Saharan Africa, driven principally by the lower inequality economies. Now, if you think of that, that second slide about relationships between inequality and growth, makes sense, right? You've got a path dependency in high income inequality economies that make them um, 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 much harder to realize growth, which is inequality reducing. But we note that this is, we, you know, the, the whole sort of Africa is not a country, uh, uh, dialogue. Just remember that this sort of trend can be generalized to the continent, but certainly not at the country level. So if you look at, at the country level where we could get decent sort of series of data, you see it's fairly messy. So you've got uh, economies where you've seen constant, some declining and some increasing income inequality. So we tried to look at the GDP story, so, so, so we clearly pick up as Kathleen in their paper, they also refer to it, that there isn't a Kuznets relationship. Um, Gary Fields has written a textbook looking at global evidence on the Kuznets relationship. It isn't evident in, in the African context. We have a very interesting result for us though, where you certainly see where the, where the green line, right, is the strongest and most positive relationship. And the green line is the fitted values for high inequality African economies. What this suggests is a certain path dependency in the growth, in the growth dynamics of these highly unequal economies, that they're more likely as they grow to continue to replicate the patterns of income inequality. And uh, I'll skip this. So one of the things uh, Chico mentioned again in his introduction is, of course, the relationship if you like. So we know about the poverty numbers in sub-Saharan Africa, but what is interesting, and this is the visual of, of Chico's in, introduction, which is based on colleagues of his at the World Bank and their macroeconometric model. If you look at the growth poverty elasticity for the rest of the developing world, right, that's the light blue bar with controls, relative to sub-Saharan Africa, what you have is a lower growth poverty elasticity in sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, realizes with the same growth rate a lower poverty reduction relative to the rest of the developing world. And so that for us is really part of the story about inequality dynamics in sub-Saharan Africa. So if I switch now to thinking about structural change, thinking about inequality dynamics and how they may be replicating themselves or not, um, one of the storylines that we develop in the paper is this notion of structural change that you need or you possibly need if you think of a Roderick uh, and Justin Lin view of the world, large scale uh, wage employment possibly or most likely in manufacturing to generate the kinds of uh, um, uh, rises in income that would reduce inequality. So we, we look then in the paper at changes in, it's a monster table, but uh, changes in sectoral employment sorry, um, changes in uh, uh, shares of GDP by sector. Again, this is an intro into the kind and the quality of the data you have in Sub-Saharan Africa. You cannot get more detailed um, sectoral breakdowns than this. And in mining, uh, mining sits in industry out, out of interest, um, um, and we managed to isolate manufacturing. The red rectangles refer to the regional changes, right, in manufacturing share of GDP. And every single estimate there is negative except for East Africa in the post-2000 period, which is almost zero. And what you've seen, right, is essentially what, what you would have to interpret as deindustrialization in sub-Saharan Africa. 
Nowhere do we actually observe, and in fact, some of the work we're doing on another project uh, at a country level replicates this, except maybe for Ethiopia. But if you take Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, South Africa, what you've seen is either flatlining of manufacturing as a share of GDP, or in fact, a decline of manufacturing as a share of GDP. And so the story for us is really that if you want to generate large numbers of uh, low-wage uh, employment, uh, you need manufacturing to be front and center of that growth dynamic. If you don't do that, and you depend, as we show a bit later, on uh, resource-based uh, uh, growth dynamics, you will more than likely, because of the nature of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a resource-based growth path, you will more than likely um, um, replicate patterns of inequality and possibly also increase inequality levels. And so, sorry, I should have shown you, if you look at some of the data here, most of the uh, uh, growth has been elsewhere, particularly in, um, in services on the employment side. But what you've effectively got is a growth dynamic of the six of the 10 fastest economies that we've been hearing about has been built on the natural resources sector, pretty much. So you've got uh, high commodity prices that have generated double digit growth rates in some of these African economies uh, that are essentially capital intensive in nature, do not generate large numbers of jobs. And the consequence has been that individuals have moved from, uh, in some economies, from agriculture directly into urban informal employment uh, variously defined, which, which, is, which simply replicates the patterns of unequal growth. Another way to think about it is that you want to be in the second quadrant. You want to be, uh, as part of a growth dynamic, you want to be reducing the share of industry, one thinks of mining, right? And you want to be growing your share of manufacturing as a share of GDP, and very few African economies are doing that. In fact, what's happening is a growth path and a growth dynamic that's based on, as we saw in the data, in the table, declining shares of manufacturing, right, in, 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 in this quadrant here, um, and an increase in the share of mining uh, as a proportion of GDP. And that first bullet rep, uh, gives you the exact estimate that 35 out of 40 uh, African economies in the sample for which we had data um, have seen a rise in the share of GDP of mining and utilities. And in fact, you could pick an African country, as particularly a fast-growing African economy that's not uh, a fragile state, and look at the sectoral data and you will see that. You'll see a rise in the share of mining and a decline in the share of manufacturing as a percentage of GDP. And that for us is symptomatic of this lack of structural change. And then to, go, to complete the story, that then replicates a pattern of inequality, a pattern of growth that is highly unequal. So with that in mind, we turn to, as I said to you, this is a laundry list of what could be some of the drivers of inequality in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's not exhaustive, and it certainly uh, uh, um, deserves close attention, and you could add to the list. The first is sort of an um, Asemoglu and Robinson-type story, which is about the history, the economic history of post-independence uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where you had small European populations that retained wealth, uh, highly extractive and arguably poor quality administrations that then focused on law and order rather than economic development. The purpose or the, um, the result of this sort of institutional setup is to replicate the patterns of inequality unlike in um, other forms of uh, other developing countries that uh, went through uh, um, a post-independence period. You then also have very strong evidence of ethnic fractionalization. There's some uh, serious econometric work which suggests that ethnic fractionalization will increase either behaviorally or structurally um, income inequality levels in, in, in a society. And that for us needs to be taken into account when one thinks of patterns of inequality in sub-Saharan Africa. Now there's a there's sort of a, almost a, a, an assumption that resource dependence on its own will increase income inequality levels and I'll go through in the next slide the um, the supposed reasons for that. Of course, there's an endogeneity problem at the outset, uh, and without the kind of data that we need, you can't actually resolve that. There is some work that tries to do that, but on the basis of cross-country evidence and so on. But all we do here is some, some sort of correlation type work. Firstly, if one looks at resource-dependent versus non-resource-dependent African economies, what you do find that the, uh, the KS test um, comes back showing that the equality of the distributions cannot be rejected. So you don't actually have significantly dis different distributions, genies, 
for resource-dependent African economies versus non-resource-dependent economies. So the story in and of itself is not empirically true, although you'll see there's a little bit of a teaser here, the tail end of the distribution. It seems like you can get very high levels of income inequality popping out of resource-dependent economies. We then um, ask the question, do you find that resource-dependent economies in sub-Saharan Africa are more poorly governed? And this is uh, from Re uh, the Revenue Watch Institute. Uh, that gives you a resource governance index. So you've got Norway, very well governed. Right at the bottom end, you've got Ma Myanmar and seven of the 15 economies that are the most poorly governed as resource dependent economies are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the channels are clear, I described them there, but these are license-based industries. If you have a license-based industry, it means that the, uh, the president or the minister is able to hand out um, licenses to preferred groups or interest groups. It, it creates a setup for, uh, for corruption, for rent-seeking behavior, and therefore also more unequal outcomes. Uh, extractive industries generally, because of the economies of scale, are more likely to involve monopolies or large multinationals, which again influences um, distributional outcomes. And then finally, what you will also find is that uh, most of your natural resource sectors are capital intensive. They're not going to be generating large numbers of uh, wage employment or large numbers of jobs for every rand of uh, for every dollar of capital investment that then um, further induces unequal outcomes. Uh, let me switch to. I've got uh, a story about labour markets, but let me quickly switch to human capital. Um, as a driver of income inequality, we all know the story about human capital accumulation and so on. But in, in the sub-Saharan context, there's two things that are going on. One is um, much lower enrollment levels at the secondary and at the tertiary level. There's also a story about uh, ECD, early childhood development. So you'll see that there's a drop-off at the beginning, ECD. There's almost no early childhood development happening. So if one thinks of um, the health economists and... Uh, public health officials telling about the first 100 days or the first five years of a person's life. There's very little enrollment in uh, early childhood development, but then there's a complete collapse post-primary in enrollment rates throughout uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And so you've got an enrollment problem at the post-secondary level, and you've got massive problems in terms of quality. This is data from the Brookings Institute, which suggests that a third of all African children are operating below the minimum threshold level for either um, reading or mathematics. We can show other data using the TIMS um, uh, standard, globally standardized tests, which again, the blue bars are bad performers, and you'll see the majority of performers in South Africa, Botswana, and Ghana, which are the African countries for the TIMS test, are performing below par. So you've got very low quality um, um, outcomes in the schooling system. Um, for every one, uh, for every, uh, 10, 100 children that enroll in the primary schooling system in sub-Saharan Africa, only four make it to a tertiary sector, to, to the tertiary institute. So what you have is an educational system that, whose job, if one thinks of R is greater than G, the famous equation for the year, I think, or the decade, human capital accumulation is supposed to do the job. It's supposed to reduce income inequality. What you've got is a schooling system that's unable to push people from primary into secondary um, schooling. And then secondly, when people are in the secondary or tertiary parts of the schooling system, the quality levels are incredibly low. And that then just reinforces the patterns of inequality. I've got a little bit about gender, where again, you've seen very little progress, and the evidence just does show that if you close gender gaps, you will close overall inequality gap gaps on a variety of um, uh, indicators. So very quickly, my conclusions, because I think I've got about a minute left. Um, so on average, what did we find? Um, both at, at the mean and at the median, you've got inequality levels in sub-Saharan Africa that are higher than other developing countries. But notice the seven outlier story. So if we remove those outlier African economies, there's no difference. So you've got inequality that's been driven, at least at the aggregate level, uh, by these seven economies. Um, we have some evidence um, for the 94 to 2010 period that overall inequality levels have declined, but again, the country data shows that there's a lot of heterogeneity there. Um, our drivers of inequality, we, we, we sort of settle on the four key factors, I'm sure the others. One is this natural resource dependence, which we think through the channel of rent-seeking, 
poor quality institutions and so on feeds inequality. Um, secondly, and for me crucially, is the lack of a dynamic um, large-scale manufacturing sector. Um, and, and that's the medium through which you create large numbers of low-wage jobs, which will narrow the income distribution. Um, I didn't have a chance to go through the labor market section, but that's essentially what we show. Um, and if you look at the, um, as a consequence of that uh, uh, low contribution from manufacturing, you've got a large share of the labor force in sub-Saharan Africa that are either in uh, um, low wage jobs in the urban informal sector, or not even wage jobs, but low paying jobs, or in agriculture. So you've got these almost low earners at the bottom end of the distribution, and then you've got a growth path that's dependent on natural resources, and that just serves to stretch the distribution. Um, and then finally, I've given you the story about human capital, but it's certainly true that um, secondary and tertiary enrollment rates and improvement in quality are essential for reducing African inequality. Thanks very much. Thank you.